live from the MIT campus in Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering the 12th annual MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of MIT CDOIQ here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Peter Burris. We're joined by Dr. Santikari. He is the Vice President and Chief Data Officer at ERT. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. We're going to call you Santi. That, yes. That's yeah. what you go by. <laughs> so start by telling our viewers a little bit about ERT, what you do uh, and what kind of products you deliver to clients. Yeah, uh, I'll be happy to do that. The ERT is um, the clinic clinical trial uh, support company and uh, we are a global data and technology company that uh, minimizes risks and uncertainties uh, within clinical trials for our customers. And uh, our customers are top uh, pharma companies, um, biotechnology companies, medical device companies and uh, they um, trust us to run their clinical trial so that they can bring their life savings drugs to the market uh, on time and every time. Uh, so, uh, so we have a huge responsibility in that regard because they put their trust in us. So we serve as their custodians uh, of data and the processes and the therapeutic experience that you bring to the table, as well as compliance related uh, expertise that we have. So not only do we provide data and technology expertise, we also provide science expertise, regulatory expertise. So that's one of the reasons um, they trust us. And we also have been around since 1977. So it's almost like over 50 years. So we have this collective wisdom that we have gathered over the years. And uh, we have really earned trust um, in this space uh, because we deal with um, safety and efficacy of drugs. And these are the two big components that um, help FDA or any regulatory authority for that matter to approve the drugs. So, um, so we have huge responsibility in this regard as well. And uh, in terms of product, as I said, um, we are in the safety and efficacy side of the clinical and trial process. Uh, and as part of that, um, we have multiple product lines. Uh, we have uh, respiratory product lines. We have uh, cardiac safety product lines. We have imaging. As you know, imaging is uh, becoming more and more uh, so important uh, for every clinical trial, and uh, particularly on the oncology space for sure, uh, to measure the growth of the tumor, that kind of thing. So we have a business that focuses exclusively on the, on the imaging side. And then we have data and analytics uh, side of the house because we provide real-time information about the trial uh, itself so that our customers can really measure risks and uncertainties before they become a problem. At this symposium, you are going to be giving a talk about clinical trials and the problems of the missteps that can happen when they're the, accurate, the data is not accurate. Um, Lay out the problem for our viewers, and then and then we're going to talk about the best practices that have emerged. Yeah, I, I think the, um, the clinical trial space um, is is very complex by its own nature. Uh, the process itself is very lengthy. And if you know one of the statistics, for example, like it takes about ten to fifteen years to really develop and commercialize a drug, and it usually costs about two and a half to three billion dollars per drug. So think about the um, enormity of this. Uh, and uh, so, so the challenges are too many. One is data collection itself. Uh, your clinical trials are becoming more and more complex, more, becoming more and more global. So that, uh, you know, getting patients to the sites is another problem, like patient selection and retention, yeah. another one. Regulatory. Uh, guidelines um, is another big issue because not every regulate, regulative authority follows the same sets of rules and regulations. Um, so And cost. 
cost is a, a big imperative uh, to the whole thing because the development life, ci life cycle of drug is so lengthy. Um, so, and as I said, it, it takes about $3 billion to commercialize a drug, and that cost comes down to the consumers, that means patients. So the cost of the healthcare is, is growing, is skyrocketing. So, and in terms of data collection, uh, there are lots of devices on the field, as you know, wearables, uh, mobile health, so the data volume is, is, is a tremendous problem. Uh, and the vendors, like each pharmaceutical companies, use so many vendors to run their trials. CROs, um, uh, like clinical research organizations, uh, they have like EDC systems, uh, they can have labs, so you name it. So they outsource all these to different vendors. Now how do you coordinate and how do you make, get them to collaborate? Uh, and that's where the data plays a big role because now the data is everywhere uh, across different systems and those systems don't talk to each other. So how do you really make real-time decisioning when you don't know where your data is? And, and data is the primary ingredient that you use to make decision. So that's why data and analytics and bringing that data real time uh, is, a, is a very, very critical service that we provide to our customers. When you look at medicine, obviously, you know, the whole notion of evidence-based medicine has been around for 15 years now yeah. or so. Yeah. And it's becoming a, a, a seminal feature of how we think about the process of delivering medical services and ultimately paying for them and everything else. And partly that's because doctors are scientists and they have a, an affinity for data. But if we think about going forward, it seems to me as though learning more about the genome and genomics is catalyzing additional need and additional understanding of the role that drugs play in the human body. It almost becomes an information problem with a yeah. drug. I don't want to say that a drug is software, but a drug is delivering something that ultimately is going to get known at a genomic level. So it, does that catalyze additional need for data? And is that changing the way we think about clinical trials? Especially when we think about, as you said, it's getting more complex because we have to make sure that a drug has the desired effect with men and women, with people from here, people from there. Is, is that, are we going to push the data envelope even harder over the next few years? Oh, uh, you bet. And, and that's where the uh, real world evidence uh, is playing a big role. So instead of you know, uh, patients coming to the clinical trials, clinical trial is going to the patient. So it is becoming more and more patient-centric. Interesting. So, uh, and the early part of protocol design, for example, the study design, that's the step one, right? So if the more and more real-world evidence data is being used to design the protocol, the very first step of a clinical trial. Another thing that is pushing the envelope is whole artificial intelligence and uh, other uh, data mining techniques, and now people can use to really mine that data, EMR data, prescription data, claims data. So those are real evidence data coming from the real patients. So now you can use these artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques to mine that data and then really design the protocol and the study design instead of flipping through the EMR data manually. So patient collection, for example, is, is no patients, no trials, right? So gathering patients and the right set of patients is one of the big problems. It takes like elongated time to uh, uh, bring those patients and even more troublesome is to retain those patients over time. So these two are like big, big things that takes long time and site selection as well, like which site is going to really be able to bring the right patients for the right trials. So, so two quick comments on that. So one of the things when you say uh, the patients, when, when, when someone has a chronic problem, chronic disease, they tend, when they start to feel better, as a consequence of taking a drug, 
they tend to not take the drug anymore, yeah. and that creates this ongoing cycle. Exactly. But going back to what you're saying, does it also mean that the that clinical trial processes, because we can gather data more successfully over time, it used to be relatively segmented. We did the clinical trial and it stopped, and then the drug went into production and maybe we caught some data. But now because we can do a better job with data, the clinical trial concept can be sustained a little bit more. That data becomes even more valuable over time, and we can add additional volumes of data back in to improve the process. Exactly. Is that shortening cl clinical trials? So, so tell us a little bit about that. Yes, so as I said, it takes about 10 to 15 years if we follow the current process, like phase one, phase two, phase three, and then post-marketing, that is phase four, right? I'm just not taking the pre-clinical side uh, of this house uh, into picture. That's about 10 to 15 years, about $3 billion kind of thing. So when you use this kind of AI techniques and the real world evidence data and all this, the, the projection is that it will reduce the cycle by 60 to 70%. That's the great. whole wow. study begin to end time. And that's, so from 15 down to four to five. Exactly, so think about, uh, there, there are two advantages. One is obviously you are creating efficiency within the system. And this drug industry and drug discovery industry is ripe for disruption because it has been using that same process over and over for, for a long time. Uh, it's like, you know, it is working, so why fix it? But unfortunately, it is not working because the healthcare cost has skyrocketed. Um, so these, these inefficiencies are going to get solved when we employ real-world evidencing into the mixture, uh, real-time decision-making, risks analysis before they become risk. Uh, instead of spending one year to recruit patients, you use AI techniques to get to the right patients in minutes. So think about the efficiency again. And also the, the home monitoring or, you know, a health type of program where the patients don't need to come to the sites, clinical sites, for checkup anymore. You can you, you can wear wearables that are FDA regulated and approved, and then they're going to do all the work from within the comfort of their home. So think about that. And another thing is like very terminally sick patients, for example they don't have time nor do they have the energy to come to the clinical site for checkup because every day is important to them. So, so, so th this is the paradigm shift that is going on. Instead of patients coming to the clinical trials, clinical trials are coming to the patients. And that said, that's a paradigm shift. And that is happening because of these AI techniques, blockchain, uh, precision medicine is another where you, you don't run a big clinical trial anymore. You just go like micro trial. You just uh, group small number of patients. Uh, you don't run a trial on breast cancer anymore. You just say breast cancer for this patients. So it's a micro trials. So and that needs... But that can still be aggregated. Exactly. It still needs to be aggregated, but you can get that early results quicker. Sure. sure so that you can decide whether you need to keep investing in the trial or not, instead of waiting 10 years only to find out that your trial is going to fail. So you're wasting not only your time, but also uh, preventing patients from getting the right medicine on time. So you have that responsibility as a pharmaceutical company as well. So, uh, so yeah, the par it is a paradigm shift, and this whole industry is uh, ripe for disruption, and ERT is right at the center. Um, we have not only data and technology experience, but as I said, we have like deep domain experience within the clinical domain, as well as regulatory and compliance experience. You need all these to navigate uh, through these uh, turbulent water of, of, of clinical research. Wow. Makes so sense? Revolutionary yeah. changes taking it place. It is, yeah. it is. And, 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 and the satisfaction is you are really helping the patients. So, um, uh, you know, and then you are... Uh, and helping the doctor. Helping the doctors. You know, at, the, at the end of the day, the drug company does not supply 
the drug. Exactly. The doctor is prescribing based on knowledge that she has yeah. about that patient and that drug and how they're going to work exactly. together. And another good statistics uh, is uh, in 2017, just last year, 60% of the FDA approved drugs sub got supported through our platform. 60%. So there were, I think, 60 drugs got approved. I, I think 30 or 35 of them got uh, used our platform to run their Amazing. clinical trial. So think about the satisfaction <laughs> that we we Job have. Job well done. <laughs> exactly. Excellent. So well, thank we, you so, so much we, for coming on the show, Sanjay. Yeah, it's yeah. been really great having you on. Yeah, oh, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Peter Burris. We will have more from MIT CDOIQ and theCUBE's coverage of it just after this.